Good morning and welcome everyone. Good morning and welcome everyone. I am Guillermo Martinez, the Deputy Director and Intergovernmental Liaison for the SUNY Institute on Immigrant Integration Research and Policy. We're excited to have you join us today to discuss the future of immigrant entrepreneurship in New York State. And we are very grateful for the participation of our distinguished speakers and panelists. We meet here today at an opportune time. National and state headlines are dominated by immigration issues and New York has become the center of related discussions. At the Institute, we are focused on advancing the knowledge on the integration of foreign born New Yorkers and promoting responsive policies and practices to narrow the social, economic and political participation gap between native born and immigrants. Today's forum is a small part of the larger work that we have begun at the Institute since it began operation earlier this year. Before we begin, I'd just like to share a couple of statistics with you. Currently, there are 4.4 million immigrants in the state of New York, making up 22.3% of the population. They pay, in 2021, they paid over $61 billion in taxes and had a spending power of over $138 billion. And for today's discussion, it is important to note that there are over 289,500 immigrant, immigrant entrepreneurs working and creating jobs in New York State. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you a national thought leader on immigrant integration, a scholar, a professor, and a dynamic architect of the components that make up and improve our civil society. Dr. Dina Refke is the Executive Director of the Institute on Immigrant Integration Research and Policy. Dr. Refke, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Guillermo, and thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, good morning and welcome again, everyone. Um, as Guillermo said, uh, this webinar is part of a series of products that we are planning at the Institute on Immigrant Integration Research and Policy to highlight the promise of immigrant entrepreneurship and chart a vision of a robust and a vibrant ecosystem that fully leverages this promise. So our goal today is to answer the question of why, why we should activate immigrant entrepreneurship and how we can do it in a systematic and consistent manner. We have an incredible line of speakers for you today who will provide answers to these questions and a call to action to fully harness that rich asset we have in our communities that remain not fully tapped. So uh, speakers' bios are going to be uploaded in the chat uh, and for you to uh, get a full picture of our distinguished uh, speakers' work. But, uh, also, please use the chat to ask questions throughout the, or the webinar. This will be the avenue for you to interact with our uh, speakers. So our webinar features a keynote speaker, Nasser Jabber, a presentation by Institute Fellow Asha Venugopalan, and a round table of six panelists who will share their wisdom and insights. We are extremely fortunate to have with us today Honorable Senator Sean Ryan, uh, Senator for the District 61 of New York State and Chair of the Senate Committee on Com Commerce, Economic Development and Small Business. Uh, we also have the Honorable Assembly Member, member Al Sturpey, Assembly Member for District District 127, New York State Assembly, and the chair of the Standing Committee on Small Business. Um, we also have Danielle Davis, director of the BIPOC Business Growth, the Capital Region Chamber, Carlos Flores Figueroa, vice president of the Business Development Center for Economic Growth, Aeon Kim, director of economic empowerment at the, at the Asian American Federation, and last but not least is Christine Rutgers, Small Business Advisor, America's Small Business Development Center. And we are extremely fortunate to have them. Uh, so please give a virtual welcome to them and we thank them for the generous gift of their time. So we start with our keynote speaker is Nasser Jabber, a chef, entrepreneur and founder of the Migrant Kitchen 
We will hear his inspirational story of how he successfully turned his business venture into a mission to lift up vulnerable populations, to lift up the most vulnerable and address food insecurities in our uh, communities. It's an incredible story of success, of giving back to communities and of commitment to civic engagement and community well-being. Please help me welcome Nasser Jabber. Nasser, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning, and thank you, everyone, for having me on this panel. I'm truly honored and humbled uh, by all of you and the work that you all do. Uh, as an immigrant founder, uh, born in Palestine, uh, grew up with American values in the West Bank and not in the West Side of the United States, uh, and arriving in the Bronx two weeks before 9-11, I would say that my journey through immigration in America has been morphed through a lot of uh, socioeconomic and political factors that uh, led me where I am today. Um, one of the things that happened by coincidence uh, as soon as I got in uh, to the country uh, when I immigrated is that I was able to read a book by uh, Barbara, I believe her last name is Erin Reich. She wrote Nickel and Dimes, which discussed um, poverty in America. I'm talking about like the jobs of, uh, you know, uh, working as waiters, working at Walmart, working as hotel maids, uh, things of the sort. And my first job was selling, uh, I don't know if you remember Nextel phones. Uh, they're like the walkie-talkie phones. They had uh, clips that you'd go on on your belt. And that was my first job selling it in the Bronx. So experiencing poverty, uh, and particularly in, in America, was something that I saw firsthand, not just as an immigrant, but also as, as an American. And I realized that poverty doesn't distinguish between both. Uh, the truth is, is that uh, economic mobility and economic inequality um, just comes after you regardless of race, gender, color, political affiliation, or what have you. So, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people who we consider our immigrant uh, talent, they usually happen to be in tech, right? Like engineers who studied somewhere in India or in China, and they came in, and that's not a lot of visible scene. But the truth is, is that there is a lot of their quote unquote unskilled labor, but they're really skilled. They're just not skilled in the in the in the white collar sense. Um, uh, and they end up working your uh, restaurants. They end up working uh, your gardening. You end up working a lot of these jobs that we consider we are considered essential during the pandemic, um, but we didn't really consider essential prior to that. So when I ended up in restaurants, you know, I struggled with it a lot. I struggled with the fact that like you know. I came here to build myself, but yet here I'm slinging hummus somewhere in Midtown, and it's not really something that I, I wanted to do. But I really deeply cared about uh, grassroots movements, immigrant integration, what have you. And it happened that as the years passed by and I stayed in food, I opened up a small restaurant uh, on the Lower East Side. And at that time, the, the Muslim ban happened, uh, the Trump ban happened on, on, on the Muslim community. Uh, and one of my best friends who is who I met very early on as well, as soon as I arrived in the United States, is Justin Levine. He's a Jewish American and uh, writer of Moulin Rouge on Broadway. He happened to be that in the by the time you know we opened the restaurant 17 years later. But um I got a call from a UN agency asking me to help resettle a Syrian refugee. And that's how the, the migrant kitchen started, is that I couldn't hire this person in this restaurant to work because unfortunately. Um, I didn't have the money to pay them. And also, also unfortunate for them is that because they were Syrian, they were queer, they were a lot of, a lot, and they also didn't have a skill or, or language, they were unable to uh, find work within the community uh, in Bay Ridge or a, a job anywhere else. So the idea was, is that we're going to hold a small dinner, hopefully raise some money and keep going. Uh, so we did the first dinner. And uh, I invited a bunch of my friends. Basically, they all paid 100 bucks or something like that. And all went to the Syrian refugee because Palestinian food, Syrian food, pretty much the same thing. And um, Justin comes up to me and tells me, this dinner is depressing. Americans love happy endings. We need a happy ending. I'm like, the guy just survived the civil war. I'm not sure if we can find a happy ending here. He's like, no, no, we need to rewrite the story in an in a empowering way. So we did, factually, but in a positive way. Uh, eventually, we discovered something at the dinner, and it's that uh, people from the community came in, uh, in particular, and I really have to say this because we live in a time of big time of division at the moment between um, the Jewish and the Arab community, but it was the, the Jewish community that came into the dinner that helped the Syrian refugee resettle. 
in which they offered him like, what do you want? He's like, I need housing. So they gave him an apartment for free, like one of the families that was there. And then that became the model. Eventually, he went to thousands of dinners, helped hundreds of people, and we called that gastro diplomacy. That led into the State Department calling one day and saying, hey, can you help us go open uh, kitchens in Turkey for Syrian and Yemeni women? And because they wanted to do a cloud kitchen project. I didn't know how aid worked, but I discovered how aid works, you know, there's and all the things that come with it. And that's a conversation for a different time. But uh, effectively, what I ended up learning is that through uh, the education that I got at a public school at Baruch College, a business school, and through which helps immigrants get into the middle class, through uh, hustle and grind, uh, you can take all the tools of entrepreneurships and entrepreneurs and say, and if you have, a, if you yourself are committed to a mission of changing your community and belonging to this community, not just the community that you come from, but the community that you are now a part of, like here in America. How can I take American values? How can I take New Yorker values and scale it? And that became the kind of work that we do. Um, so it started off with, you know, building these refugee kitchens in Turkey. Eventually it led to going to Morocco because um, the United States decided to get into uh, halal beef and chicken. And Morocco was the first country to import the meat. And meat is a big big thing in the Arab world uh, or in the Muslim world, it's, it's, it's expensive to get. This was made it more accessible. So we did that project. Um, eventually by COVID, uh, I started doing catering based on uh, the way that I saw America, which is through the lens of migrants. Um, and I'm, I'm very careful here when I say that with the, with the lens of migrants. Uh, I mean that, you know, for a long time, you know, we thought of American food as, as burgers and pizza, but the truth of the matter is, is that there are so many communities here that have thrived for a long time that, you know, is Chinese food uh, and American food. And the truth is, is that if you look at John Sao chicken or the fortune cookie, they're all made here, uh, the chicken wings and fried rice, they're not really Chinese food, right? Like, but that's the food that we enjoyed, at least in the Bronx that was accessible and cheap and, and, and got flavor, right, at the time. So the idea was to build um, an entire company based on that. And as COVID hit around, uh, I had a thousand meals in, in the fridge and I got a call from a friend of mine on March 16th. This is like a, a day or the two days after the shutdown asking me that uh, they need food in the ER and they didn't have meals. So we started sending out meals to uh, the frontline workers. A journalist that follows from the refugee dinner days uh, said, are you feeding the healthcare workers? And I said, yes, eventually went on TV, eventually it scaled. And uh, eventually we started helping the Department of Aging in New York City feed around three and a half million meals in New York. Um, and the way that we did that is uh, by mobilizing the migrant community. So we didn't have a way to deliver them around. And uh, we were able to get taxi drivers from Jackson Heights. Uh, we were also delivering uh, food uh, to the city needs, but also taking that profit and delivering to other needs that were ghosts in the system. I'm talking about like people who didn't get any benefits during the pandemic, who were also going hungry um, in different communities in Queens, in the Bronx, and, and so on and so forth. So eventually, as it scaled, uh, we ended up not just uh, engaging in New York. I mean, we also did Jerusalem. We also did Lebanon, which was going through uh, a, a, an insane economic crisis. And we realized that the people to people diplomacy and the people to people help is what really matters at the core value. But you cannot do that if you don't have sound business principles. Now, what's great about being in America or being in New York in particular is that you have all these resources available to you. And the idea is that how do you take it and execute it and build on it and integrate yourself as a proud member of this community and the community that you come from and do things coherently and correctly. Now, that's just of a person who, again, was slinging hummus and it's scaled that way. Sometimes I feel like an imposter for being here because maybe I shouldn't have been here. But the truth is that immigrant founders are very determined to come in and do things. And this is why we should encourage them. And if you look at the face of Silicon Valley, if you look at the big tech um, uh, companies, a lot of them happen to be immigrant uh, founders, they either who immigrated here or, the, or first generation. And the reason is that is that they want more from life. They want to build, they believe in the values and the um, the American dream, if you will. And a lot of people will tell you the American dream is, is, is fiction, right? Like, you know, it's not necessarily something that can be attained right now. But for some, it can be, right? Um, if they have the right tools, if they're able to adapt and so on and so forth. So 
the idea would be is that how to take the principles that you care about, whether it's immigration, environmental, or anything else, and put it into a perspective. And I would tell you that you will find that people who have fled their homeland for one reason or the other are willing to help you or achieve those goals for this community because they want to be integrated. They want to belong. And at the same time, they want to build a home. It's not go use something and, and then go back home and, and not care about it. This is, you know, we have to be all integrated and welcome together. So in a nutshell, that's my story. Um, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Nasser, thank you so much. This has been really a powerful, powerful example of, of uh, immigrant entrepreneurship, immigrant you know, uh, motivation. If this is not giving back and fulfilling really collective responsibility and obligation to community, I do not know what is. Uh, thank you so much for inspiring us. And, and this word of scaling up the American dream, scaling up values, it's going to remain with us etched in our memory for sure. Um, it's truly really an example of what is possible when people commit not just to their individual success, but to the collective well-being. All boots all boats must rise and all boats will rise when this happens. So um, I'll turn it over to now to Asha uh, Venugoplan, a fellow at the Institute on Immigrant Integration and Policy. And Asha will answer the questions of why, why we should pay attention to immigrant entrepreneurship. And um, Asha has two messages for uh, everybody, that immigrant entrepreneurship is a poverty mitigation measure and a critical economic development mechanism. And the second message is that there are unique barriers facing immigrants that they do not share with their native born counterparts. And if we wish to dismantle these barriers, we must adopt a stewardship, proactive approach and not a safe air approach or one size fits all. Take it away, Asha. Um, hello, and a very good morning to everyone and the incredible panelists today. Um, as Dr. Refke said, um, I'm going to try and talk about the promise of immigrant entrepreneurs. Um, I couldn't say it any better than uh, what Mr. Jeffers said. Um, so I'm going to try and uh, add a little few more details um, to, to understand our situation or uh, the topic a little more. Now, uh, contrary to uh, the popular rhetoric, uh, immigrants are, in fact, job creators. Immigrant entrepreneurs, immigrants are 80% more likely to start businesses than native born citizens. Um, this has been shown in multiple studies uh, between um, 1996 and 2021. The immigrant share of businesses in the U.S. has went from 13.3 percent to about almost 30 percent. So three out of every 10 uh, businesses in the U.S. are immigrant uh, owned. As um, was discussed earlier, um, when we look at recent studies, especially in 2022, uh, there were studies that showed that um, over half, 55% of billion dollar startups in the US were founded by immigrants. And there are other studies that show that immigrants revive declining towns. Immigrants move into towns that um, have seen declining populations, they start businesses, and they increase the, the tax revenue, which improves local services and just makes the town better for everyone. Although, um, Immigrants are overrepresented in businesses of all sizes. Um, immigrants have, immigrant entrepreneurs have started tech companies and non-tech companies, but immigrant presence is most pronounced among small businesses. While uh, immigrant entrepreneurs exist in all fields, um, the reason we need to consider the small businesses is because the small businesses are more, uh, are closely related to a survival mode. The, the entrepreneurs and the owners are very much hand to mouth and trying to survive through every month and every day. So what are the key um, hurdles 
um, or barriers that immigrant entrepreneurs face. I would like to think about this as one of uh, the one of my interview interviewees told me. Think of it as a funnel. There is a funnel, and it, it captures all the available resources and the capital, and um, the funnel shrinks uh, for immigrant entrepreneurs. So first, there is documentation and financial literacy. Immigrants often, immigrant entrepreneurs um, often don't, like many other small businesses, maybe don't have their books in order or don't have a clear business plan. Um, they might uh, use their personal bank accounts for business bank accounts. And all of these relate to financial literacy. And although immigrant entrepreneurs have an innate sense of entrepreneurship and risk taking, they might not understand that there are certain modes, uh, there are certain best practices. This relates to another factor, um, banking and credit requirements. Immigrant entrepreneurs um, often don't have similar access to uh, banking and uh, capital. This is uh, partly because as a study showed that access to uh, banking credit is related to home ownership and immigrants are less likely than native born population to own homes. Another factor, and as an immigrant student and as many immigrants would know, um, credit profiles. Credit scores don't transfer across countries. And so immigrants who come to the country have a tough time and have to build a credit profile from scratch. And it takes a much longer period of time. Additional um, a factor is institutional knowledge that connects these previous factors. All of the factors that I'm going to discuss today, they're all interconnected. They all play into each other. Um, immigrants, of course, uh, might not come, might not have as good an English uh, proficiency, and so face barriers to gaining the information due to lack of a li lack of linguistic proficiency. Immigrant entrepreneurs also come from various different cultures and so the business practices in their home countries are not the may not be the business practices in the United States and to gain that institutional knowledge is vital and it is so important it's relate it relates to financial literacy it relates to how to access credit um, and it is often limited by um, linguistic barriers and the fourth category is capacity and awareness this is this is more from the institutional perspective. There are many wonderful organizations like the SBDCs and the CDFIs, but many at many times I have been told that many immigrant entrepreneurs do not know about the existence of these institutions, or often CDFIs might not have the required funding to cater to all small businesses and immigrant entrepreneurs. So there is also a capacity and awareness problem to this. What is the ecosystem like for immigrant entrepreneurs? And this is also more generally for small businesses. We have made perhaps four broad categories of organizations. There are federal and state agencies that cater to small businesses. Um, here's the list. There are small business administration. New York City has small business services. There's minority business development agency. There are of course SBDC, small business development centers. There are also um, CDFIs that offer small and micro loans, and these are absolutely vital to small businesses and immigrant entrepreneurs. There are also many instances, many programs that are public-private partnerships. For instance, the Immigrant Business Initiative uh, and the Immigrant Business Connection. There was also in the last couple of years, the New York Small Business Opportunity Fund that brought together many government and non-governmental players to cater to small businesses. And of course, there are grassroots organizations that cater to and, and understand at a fundamental level, the barriers that face um, immigrant entrepreneurs and small businesses. Um, and we also have um, Ms. Kim from uh, Asian American Federation here today. So what could be potential solutions and what, what could there be, what suggestions could there be? Um, um, first, we could start with what about credit profiles? Are there alternate approaches to credit profiles and credit scores? Uh, perhaps this would be more um, at a state or federal level. 
uh, there could be certain streamlining of documentation requirements. Um, many government um, grants and, uh, for instance, in New York Small Business Opportunity Fund would require certain types of business and tax documents, which may not be realistic. Uh, many small businesses may just not be able to provide them, and this would be even more difficult for immigrant entrepreneurs. So maybe a more realistic, streamlined documentation. Um, of course, another a solution would be to increase funding uh, that's available for CDFIs and offer CDFIs greater flexibility on who receives this funding. Um, another great avenue would be partnerships, partnerships with among local chambers of commerce, immigrant associations, and local gunmen. There are multiple case studies where partnerships have immensely helped understand the uh, barriers facing immigrant entrepreneurs and been able to scale that um, understanding to cater to all small businesses. More one-stop shops um, where immigrants and small businesses can come, come to one point where they can access legal, financial, and business advising. And that becomes a point where not only can uh, small businesses and people just collaborate, but also receive all the information without having to go to different organizations. Another solution, a suggestion would be to, to improve the awareness of SPDCs and CDFIs and to reach people where they are. Immigrants might not access information at the same places where currently where the information is provided. A lot of immigrant communities communicate through WhatsApp groups, and that would be an avenue to spread the information. They might communicate through certain Facebook groups. So to, to have a more targeted approach uh, to create that awareness. Um, one of my uh, the interviewees um, I spoke to said, SBDCs are the, uh, the best uh, health secret in New York. And I, this should just not be the case. Everyone, every immigrant should know about SBDC. Every small business should know about them. And uh, finally, what are the alternate ways of funding immigrant um, entrepreneurs? Uh, an option would be ROSCAs, which are rotational uh, savings and credit associations. These have been, these are informal groups that have existed in immigrant communities that exist in many other parts of the world where community communities come together and collectively save and provide credit. Um, in more recent years, um, young entrepreneurs have created apps that, that ensure transparency and trust and uh, provide a platform. So it is a viable option. Um, and with certainly with some institutional help, it could be scaled up. Um, I would like to thank um, all the interviews that I spoke to and gave so much information and so many suggestions. Um, thank you. And uh, back to you, Dr. Refke. Asha, thank you so much. Uh, you definitely provided us with an excellent foundation to our roundtable. And it's now my pleasure to welcome again our roundtable speakers, uh, Assemblywoman, uh, Assembly, uh, Assemblyman uh, L. Sturpey, uh, Senator Sean Ryan, Christine Rutgers, Small Business Advisor, America's Small Business Development Centers, A. Young Kim, from the Asian American Federation, Carlos Flores Figueroa from the um, Center for Economic Growth, and Danielle Davis from the Capital Region Chamber. Welcome back. So our first question is for our legislators in the room, Honorable Al Sturpey and Senator Sean Ryan. Thank you again for joining us today. As you heard from Asha, um, immigrant entrepreneurs have additional barriers. They have additional challenges. They definitely face the same barriers that any um, uh, any uh, uh, native born face as they uh, try to set up a new business. Uh, however, there are additional and unique challenges uh, that you heard from Asha. Uh, and that question goes to both of you, uh, Senator and Assemblyman. Uh, how, 
uh, what do you tell us about what current merit measures are being considered and at the legislature, um, a legislature rather, to address these barriers and these challenges that are specific to immigrant entrepreneurship? And um, do you think that there is an appetite in Albany to address or move forward some of the solutions that Asha talked about, for example, increase overall funding and support for community development financial institutions, um, tax credits and other incentives to help small businesses thrive? Who should start? Probably <laughs> should start. Oh, OK, thank you. Um, you know, as as I uh, tried to prepare for this, uh, I spoke to the group I work most closely with in central New York, and that's Center State CEO. They're the economic development community organization. And I remember that, I don't know, it was five or six years ago, uh, they had come to me with a request and I had provided them uh, with a grant. It wasn't that big, it was $100,000. But from that, they built something quite uh, successful. And, you know, we talked initially about, well, what about SBA loans? What about this and that? And they said, well, SBA is too much. One size fits all. Really doesn't pertain to immigrants. And when you're dealing with immigrant populations, it has to be very customized. So, um, as Asha was talking about the barriers, you know, permitting taxes, technologies, insurance, all that other stuff that you have to know about um, needs to be learned at, at some point. So Center State created a program called Start It. It's a 15 week program covering 15 modules. And it's all the basics of starting a business. And it's taught by a business owner who was formerly an immigrant or refugee or from some economically disadvantaged community, someone that everyone can relate to. And during that 15 week period, they build a business plan. And one of the big benefits of this program is that 50% of the people realize this is not what they wanna do and they don't go forward. They sort of move on to some workforce development areas where they can get a job and, and that works out. And the workforce development is, as you might know right now, because we're in such desperate need of employees, provides almost 100% uh, uh, positioning for, for those individuals. So the other 50% come back and after that, um, they, they have, another program called the Upstart program, and that helps them connect uh, the entrepreneurs with all the networks they're gonna need. So, you know, you're talking about um, where are they gonna source their product? What are the overhead costs gonna be? How are they gonna find all their customers? And where are they gonna get capital that's like, if they have no credit or low credit? Um, what they took the $100,000 I provided them with was they created a growth equity fund and it provided small loans and it was character-based loans. So they figured if they had completed this 15 week program, these people are committed. They really want to do it. And, and I'll go back a little bit. You know, they have a two track program because with immig immigrant populations, the startups, at least half or more than half are food because, you know, they, they miss home. They, they miss the food, the, the culture and everything. And they want to provide this for the rest of uh, the immigrants in their community too. So they have two tracks, one's food and one's general business. Uh, but the, the new program, the upstart program connects them with these, um, you know, relationships they need. They also provide a case manager. So this person is helping them with where they have to go and who they can and connect with. Um, also, there's, there's other issues. And I, I guess if I wanted to have one big idea 
that I could communicate. And what they, they told me was, it's not just a government program. It's not just center state program. It's the entire community that needs to be committed to doing this because now they have to find facilities. So they go to landlords and every once in a while they find a benevolent landlord who is willing to sign a lease. And maybe for the first year, they won't charge any rent at all. And this is really a big help uh, for a lot of these businesses. Um, so that, you know, is how in central New York, um, a lot of the immigrant businesses get started. And you know, the, the, the issue uh, around capital is probably one of the most important. And the character-based lending is really critical. Um, the one thing that they did tell me was there was definitely a lack of CDFIs in central New York. There's only two of them. One of them um, is home headquarters, which is exclusively for housing. And the other one I think is uh, cooperative FCU, but there's a lack of it. But what has happened with that $100,000 they initially loaned out, what they found was immigrant uh, businesses have a lower uh, failure rate they also pay back the loans much faster than they're required to. And because of that, they've been able to entice uh, some other businesses to help out. KeyBank, AmeriCue, uh, Pathfinder, uh, a bunch of foundations have all chipped in money now to build this. Now they have over a million dollars in this fund. So again, it's the whole community has to participate in order to make this all successful. I don't know, I don't wanna to go too much farther. I want, I want Sean to tell us all the wonderful things in, uh, in Buffalo. Please go ahead, Senator. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, uh, Assembly Member Sturpey. You know, it's very, very, very thoughtful. So, you know, I, th I think the big problem is, um, is, is Nasser your first name or last name? First thing. Uh, first. First thing. I think I think what Nasser pointed out is is sort of um, illustrative of the of sort of the larger challenge. So Buffalo has been very active in the refugee resettlement uh, cause for about a decade. We've resettled more people in Buffalo than than anywhere else uh, in New York State. But the sort of cruel inside joke amongst uh, people who are in this field is that for sixty days you're a refugee. On day 61, you're a poor person who doesn't speak English, uh, who's on public assistance. Like, there's no difference then. You're, you're just one more poor person you know, in America. In America has one of the highest poverty rates of any developed nation. So you know that, that's the economy you're coming into, an economy that accepts a massive um, adult poverty rate as the norm and a massive child poverty rate uh, as the norm. So we've tried to develop programs to, um, you know, specialize in assisting, you know, refugees. And most of that is through our existing refugee resettlement programs. After the Trump ban uh, went into effect, we were afraid our refugee resettlement organizations would go out of business. So we, we banded together, Assembly Member Sturpey and I and several others, uh, to make sure we got funding to those agencies so they can stay in business when nobody was coming. And then instead of getting paid to resettle, they got paid to offer additional services to refugees who are already in our community to help with uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a cultural assimilation, skills acquisition, and, and language um, acquisition. And then we've been able to maintain that and in, enhance that. Um, but that's really working on the basics. Um, you know, if you don't learn English, the chances of you remaining in poverty stay pretty high. Um, your child's educational achievement will be hampered. So we've been sort of trying to look at, you know, more of the, the Maslow's, you know, needs of can we get people into language acquisition classes? 
can we put people uh, you know in, into jobs? And you know the the sort of third item that goes along with Nasser's point is we have a huge low income full time work population in New York State. So, you know, these are all these variables that are just a given for poor people in New York State. You add on that, that you're, uh, you know, a refugee suffering from trauma, you know, you, you don't speak English, it all becomes uh, more compounded. And, you know, and I talk about the refugee community because, you know, immigrants are probably the most economically rational actors of, of anyone in America. And they're not beating the path to Buffalo. Uh, because of our economy isn't that strong. They're going to New York, they're going to Chicago, they're going to Los Angeles. So, you know, the people who are making a choice generally are, are skipping uh, the upstate cities. It's the refugees who don't have a choice and are essentially assigned to live somewhere who we are trying to bring into our economy. And then from the business development, you know, we, we work very closely with our small business development center you know, everything that was just mentioned about language sensitivity, doing things on Slack and, and WhatsApp, like we're hitting it on that. We have community development, financial institutions, you know, and we have a lot of nonprofits who are inspired, who, who have been settling, resettling uh, displaced people for over a century into our community. You know, it's all starting, most of our group started in the twenties after the pogroms in, in, in Russia. And then they became the Balkan resettlement and then the World War II resettlement. They've all stayed together and they are the ones currently settling, you know, people from all over the globe. But, you know, we have shiny stories, which I support and I love, but I don't know how you can broad base them over the entire population. You know, we recently had a fantastic open Westminster Church as a Westminster Economic Development uh, Institute. Uh, they've been helping uh refugees established small businesses for nearly a generation we just opened up a, a brand new uh bazaar hub where there's probably 20 vendors uh, selling mostly food uh so, some non-food items but doing business uh skills acquisition the goal is one day people move out of those things but love it but recognizing it's a small percentage of the of, of refugees who are coming into Western New York are seeking entrepreneurship uh, over, over basic employment. But if I had a magic wand, it would be more of the Canadian system where your benefits, your, your, your sort of status doesn't change after 60 days, you, you, know, you go longer. Um, there's a mandate that you take language acquisition classes. You, you, you can't skip out if you wanna go to the next step in the immigration. Um, you know, process. There's benefits available during that period of time. All language acquisition classes in Canada are paid for by the uh, the federal government. They teach cultural understanding, um, and they do li better linkages with job training. So, we have a long way to go uh, in America and in New York State on the issues of uh, refugees and immigrants, but also on the issue of having a very unequal uh, economy that we're working very hard. You know. To remedy. And I'll just sort of close with this. We seem to have no problem in New York State giving hundreds of millions of dollars to places like Tesla, Amazon, chip factories. And we do that without blinking or blushing. But when it comes time to do a $20,000 small business grant, then you hear about socialism and why we giving away. And, you know, the whole conversation changes. But the work I'm doing, the work uh, somebody member Sturpier is doing, we're trying to change this 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 idea of the silver bullet economic development it means you have to go give you know Amazon tens of millions of dollars to come to your community to create a low wage workforce. We already know how to do that without government intervention. So the idea is how do we how do we switch this conversation? So it's something I've been working on, something I'm going to continue uh, to work on. But if we had an easy solution, uh, we'd, we'd have it finished by now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator Ryan. I want to go back to Nasser Jabber for a moment here and ask the question. 
um, you definitely provided us what Assembly Women's Therapy was talking about, a community, a whole of community approach. You were able to mobilize communities to, um, to undertake this initiative, not just locally, but globally. And there were definitely funding and, and support uh, involved. So it's really a textbook example of what Assembly Members Therapy was talking about. Were there any lessons that you drew from your experience um, about how to mobilize community members, how to leverage um, the support uh, that exists in the community and, and really change the narrative like Senator Ryan was talking about, you know, uh, funds for, you know, the communities that are, are really struggling and, and needing of those um, 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 precious dollars. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you again, Senator Ryan and Assembly Assemblyman Stripe. I, I think your your to your points before I answer this question is that are are absolutely correct. We need a longer term model than sixty days. That's definitely maybe similar to the Canadian model, um, where there is language integration. One hundred percent is a must, or maybe also skilled labor is a must. I mean, we need plumbers, we need technicians, we need electricians, we need construction workers. Like this is these are jobs that we can. Or custodial, like something I worked with uh, some of the Syrian women that came in through our refugee dinners, they ended up in custodial work and they earned a good living doing that. Um, but, you know, also there is the other side of that, which is like the Swedish model, which is like five years in and all of a sudden they're just dependent on aid and they, they can't get out of it. So like the balance, the balance of both in terms of. That's how, now, you're, now you're like not can be over like the no, Canadian no, model. I'm with models you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I support that exactly 100%. Um, but the Swedish the model I, makes you look at how, if you really want to integrate people into the economy, there's a way to do it. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's exactly uh, in the point. And that's the, really what the migrant kitchen was, is that really integration through training, labor, and, and, and mobility. And also we were the first ones to pay 25 an hour, uh, you know, for, for food workers um, in, in New York City. And that was reported on. But the thing is, is that access to capital, is, in, in, to your point, is ex extremely hard. And that is true that the SBA uh, loans are a one size fit all. I mean, like the Migrant Kitchen now is a company that does million dollars of revenue and still doesn't get SBA loans. Right. You know, like it, we still ha are struggling to do that because of the way that it's structured. So when we first started, uh, honestly, we had to run on personal credit cards and we also have been active in the community prior to launching the Migrant Kitchen. So when we launched a small GoFundMe that raised like $50,000, that was like kind of like our startup capital to keep going through. And it wasn't an, an exceptional story. But if I am, say, a migrant from Bangladesh, I have limited English speaking skills, what are my possibilities of trying to find work today? So to the point that was given is that they would prefer employment because it's a secured income coming through. And then maybe in a few years later, as they learn the language and the system and how it works, they will access the capital, but that capital will also be self-bought in either through personal savings, personal loans, or through credit cards. Um, we just don't have the access as immigrant founders if we don't, again, immigrant founders from certain economic um, you know, backgrounds, you know, if you're an immigrant founder that went to Harvard, that's a different story. Um, but people who come from like the poverty line, which is where I came from, it's hard to get capital and you're going to have to take that risk. And a lot of people are afraid to take that risk, not because they're unwilling, but because they have kids. You know, I was also lucky to be a single, healthy, you know, younger person when I started this. So that's also like important. Um, but we need to make funds available and also training available and entrepreneurial training available and segmented training available based on skills and, and, and capabilities available because maybe out of a program, for example, that uh, assembly member uh, Strep spoke about 50% don't want to become entrepreneurs. They want to become employees, but maybe the other guys can hire them if they scale up, but a hundred grand, 200 grand is really not going to do much to the point we can give millions of dollars to companies like Amazon, which already have billions. Why can't we put like a 20 or $30 million fund into building um, immigrant founders to launch small businesses or even allow them to get easier permits? For example, like the food cart system is only like 200. It's becoming a monopoly where you have to pay $100,000 to someone to, you know, operate the license. So it, it is important to, you know, work fe government 
and private business together to solve this problem. And I think the real people who are going to help you from the private side are immigrant founders themselves that can work with government officials to integrate this. And the faster that we do it, the more economic advantage for the city and the community we will have. Thank you, Nasser. I want to now turn it over to Asha to ask some questions of other panelists. Thank you, Dr. Brefke. Um, I'd like to, um, so this is a question uh, for um, Ms. Danielle Davis. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you are the director of uh, BIPOC Business Growth the, at the Capital Region Chamber. The Capital Region Chamber provides um, incredible uh, business assistance services um, aimed at growth acceleration, support for BIPOC owned businesses, certification, coaching, skill building. These are just amazing, amazing services that um, business owners, especially immigrant entrepreneurs, um, need. Um, question I have is how could we take, um, but m most of these services are, are designed for a, a mainstream audience. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on how we could take a mainstream system and and tweak it and um, work with it so that the considerations and the needs of foreign-born entrepreneurs um, and their unique needs and wants um, are, are met and that's also mainstreamed. Thank you, um, Asha, for that question. And thank you to the Institute for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, before I even attempt to answer your question, I just want to say that your presentation, I was making notes because those are the exact things that I observe working with um, immigrant entrepreneurs in this project and that I myself face. So, you know, you, you approach it from a scientific angle where you actually, you know, did some, some research and got some statistics, but all that research has now confirmed, you know, my real life lived experiences, you know, the language, the culture, the financial literacy, all of that. Um, so the Capital Region Chamber is um, the oldest chamber here in the Capital Region of New York State. Um, and we do have an entrepreneur boot camp. It's an EAC center um, for those who don't know, that's the Entrepreneur Assistance Center. Um, that is recognized, authorized by New York State. And we literally run the bootcamp twice per year and we help people to get MWB certification, do that um, business. I, I, I like to call it a mini MBA because it's a very intense course. Um, Assemblyman Sterpy mentioned earlier about something that they have in central New York about that. 15 week training. So it's it's similar to that. And, and I'm happy to know that Central New York has something in place similar to what we have here. So we go through and we 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 train entrepreneurs. And as the assemblyman said, some people at the end of it decide, ah, okay, this is not for me. So it's a good exercise to go through. And this boot camp is subsidized by Empire State Development because we're EAC Center. Um we do have immigrants doing it. As a matter of fact, the boot camp is graduating next week and they're doing their business pitch competition. They started yesterday and some are doing it today. And one of my clients, she's from Ecuador, Hispanic lady, and she's as native as they come. When you see her family, that's straight up native, <laughs> you know. Um, she's in the boot camp. And because she's one of my clients, I said, okay, let me check in with her, see how she's going with the business plan. It's a very good course. Lots of stuff is taught. But then the language barrier is there. So it's not that she doesn't attend the class and she's running her business while she's doing all of that. But understanding what is required to produce that business plan, to submit it at the end, to do the business pitch competition, to hope to win that money that's available for the winner and the second place person, she struggles. She struggles with just getting the um the financial projections done. And it's not that she's stupid. It's just that there is a language barrier. So you stand at the front of a class and, and you know, you're passing on information you're teaching. But we have to recognize when we have someone in that class that English is not their first language. I myself am from a country where English is what we speak. 
but there are cultural differences. So yes, I may, I may have a good grasp of the English language, but there are certain words, the way I pronounce them, there are certain things that, you know, certain things that we say, certain innuendos that may be misconstrued. And so we have to be aware that we have people in the ecosystem that struggle with the language culturally and to put things in place to help these people. Um, so it's taking these mainstream courses and maybe having a, a targeted program to say, okay, we're running this boot camp, particularly for immigrants, or we're running a boot camp. And once you recognize that you have an immigrant who has a completely different cultural experience, they may speak the English language, but if that's not their first language, how can we now help this person or these people who are doing this to understand the material that is being passed on to them? Also, if I'd say, and, and this probably has to be local, in the same way um, Central New York has things in place, is if each municipality or region can actually get their immigrant associations to do these things, have these things in place. We do have the local resources, the Apex Accelerator, Ignite U, Nice Tech, SBDC, all of that. And luckily for NY, um, for SBDC here in the capital region, they do have language speakers. So they have like Greg Chinese and these other people that are Asian and other ethnicities that can actually help. But it's not that it's designed that way, it's that it happened that way. So maybe these agencies that offer these kind of support for entrepreneurs can make a targeted effort to say, let's have something that will help the immigrants. Let's be mindful of the fact that we have people from the Middle East, we have Asians, we have Hispanics, we have people from the Caribbean that um, want to be entrepreneurs as well and they struggle because of this this and this reasons um should, you know what i think i answered that part i'll, I'll allow you to to ask more questions because i was just about to go on and on and on <laughs> thank you so much uh miss davis um i'm a question uh as you mentioned you're you're uh also an immigrant and an entrepreneur um in terms of challenges facing immigrant um, entrepreneurs and immigrant owned businesses, um, do, is, um, do you feel like today's business climate is friendlier or harsher to, to immigrant entrepreneurs? It is harsher. Um, and it is simply because, and it's not that people want to be harsh or they're trying to exclude immigrants. It's simply because it has not been thought about. So when I came here, lucky for me, and Nasser mentioned it earlier about you have people coming in that may have different economic experiences. Fortunate enough for me, I served in the military back home and I had saved and have a little nest egg. Um, you know, I was each month I was wiring money to my account here in New York. Just family lived here. So um, you know, I, I had a residency. So I said, when I decided to, to move here, if I decide to move here, I want to be comfortable. And after serving in the military for 18 years, I'm like, I don't want to go work for someone. I want to be an entrepreneur. Coming to America and you hear about credit score, I'm like, what's that? That's not a thing where I come from. Where I come from, if you have money in the bank and you go to the bank and say, I need a loan, they're going to like, Oh, I lend you money. You have a job. You have money. I will lend you money because you have money. I had, when I came here, I bought a two family house, cash, and I still had $276,000 in the bank in savings. I could not get a credit card. I had zero credit. How do I get credit? Why won't anyone lend me money? I have money, see? Oh, you need credit. 
And I now had to understand what credit is. And contrary to what most Americans believe, 90% of countries in the world don't have a credit system. There's not, no such thing called a credit score. It's American, it's Canadian, and it's slowly seeping its way into other countries. But it's a shock to our system to understand that you're not going to get credit because you have not established credit. Of course, I had to ask and I learned, okay, you get a secured credit card. And it's amazing. I moved from zero credit to 820 in six months simply because I got a zero um and a secured credit card. But these are the little things that can impact someone trying to establish themselves, establish a business that we don't know. There are other things I faced um, when I decided to start a business, just some basic laws, labor regulations, things like that, where if you don't know things that are specific to the United States and specific to the state that you're in, you can get in trouble. You can violate laws. Simple things that you go, oh, but that's nothing. Yes, it is something. Three months into opening a business, I was fined $1,000 by the Department of Labor. Not because I've done something wrong. And I still, to this day, say I didn't do anything wrong. An employee, he had his little girl. He would pick her up from school in the evening, bring her there. She would sit and do her homework until her mom came to pick her up. And she's so smart. She's in the STEM program and everything. And she's good with math. And she wanted to play with the cash register. And she was having fun. And I allowed her to. And the customers would walk in and she'd be like, hi, how may I be? And she just wanted to be on the cash register. Someone went and reported that I was doing child labor. And this little girl was about eight, nine. The Department of Labor came and it was explained to them. They see it. And they said, well, nope, she should not be on the register. We're going to fine you $1,000. Um, she cannot be on the register anymore. When she comes, she has to sit in a corner. That little girl threw a tantrum and said, dad, I don't want to come here anymore if I can't play on the register. I did not hire her. She never got a dime. But understanding labor laws can impact you. Knowing these little things can impact you as an entrepreneur, an immigrant entrepreneur. And so those are some personal experience when you talk about cultural. You mentioned financial literacy earlier. Um, and that is important, understanding not just credit score, but what the banks look for. A bank in Turkey may look for something else when they're deciding to lend someone some money, as opposed to what the financial system in the United States is in terms of what they're looking for. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I will pass the, the torch back to uh, Dr. Rapke. Yeah, Asha, thank you so much. And thank you, Ms. Davis. You really pointed out a few uh, issues that we are really um, highlighting here. And um, I want to ask Christine. Um, Christine, you work with New York State Small Business Development Center, and you help thousands of entrepreneurs each, each year. And uh, your work really uh, with the CBDC clients focus on helping them succeed. And so our question is, as you heard, uh, and probably have a frontline seat into these issues, uh, that um, not just the knowledge of credit, um, uh, the credit system, but it's really accessing the credit system is, is really out of reach for a lot of uh, immigrants because of the lack of credit history and and so one of the um, uh, the um, uh, solutions that we um, are highlighting here is really the alternative uh, system to the credit system or alternative system to the credit scoring and so are there any conversations within the banking industry of moving past credit scores or modifying the credit scoring formula to help um, those entrepreneurs who will want to establish business um, and who lack credit scores? Um, are there, for example, uh, this idea of character-based uh, lending being considered um, or any other alternatives to the current system that really provides a huge gap? Um, thank you, Dr. Rusky, and everyone for all the 
all the insight of some things I didn't wasn't aware of either. So um, my background is traditionally um, banking. I worked for m and Bank for 10 years as a senior manager in the branches where I've seen a lot of this particular situation. I'm in Rochester, New York. Um, while there's not a lot of immigrants in one particular area, um, there are students who have come over who are trying to establish businesses and uh, get an education. And to move past a credit score, um, I don't think that we're there. Um, as a bank, you you need to have that uh, social security number, which I has found has been a problem for lending. The social security number um, determines the credit worthiness of a person in, in America. Um, it's a major factor in determining the suitability for a loan. It's that unique identifier. So if the loan goes bad, the bank has a way to um, gain and grab back those funds, right? Um, I don't I don't see the credit score going away, but as, as an SBDC advisor, we advise our clients on other alternative financing, right? Like government and nonprofit supports, um, community-based lending, uh, microfinancing. But here's the problem. And, and I also advise in a rural community in my area. Um, you have to be able to sustain the business after you have the funds. So let's say we give one of our clients a micro loan for $50,000, okay? And we fund them and that, that buys them their, their food and their food truck and, you know, maybe get some starting on a little piece of their insurance. How are they going to sustain because they don't have the money or the education or the means to continue running their business and we're seeing them fail. So that would be my question, you know, as a banker, I followed the rules, right? I had to do what the financial institutions wanted me to do, but this is why I now work for the SBDC so I can help my business clients. And I'm seeing that while these programs are great, where's the sustainability? Thank you, Christine. Uh, I'll turn it over to Asha now. Asha, take it away. All right. Thank you, Dr. Refke. Um, now, um, I have a, a couple of questions for uh, Mr. Figueroa. Um, I hope I'm saying uh, your last name correctly. Um, now, um, a lot of um, a lot of immigrant businesses are uh, mom and pop stores, but there are many, many immigrant businesses are also manufacturing companies. Um, and uh, the Center for Economic Growth uh, does amazing work supporting these uh, manufacturing companies to improve their business management, uh, commercial production, sustainable growth, innovation. Um, what could what can you tell us? Uh, could you tell us something about? what the center is seeing in terms of immigrant entrepreneurship and uh, manufacturing companies in New York, because that is not, we, we hear a lot about um, food entrepreneurs, we hear a lot about mom and pop stores, um, but what, could you give us an insight into the manufacturing companies? Of course, thank you so much, Asha, uh, great question. And thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one very quick intro comment for those who know who knows me, will get a little bit of my sometimes this sense of humor, but my, my dad always told me, if you're going to get a job at the traditional banking system, you need to prove that you don't need one. I was based on a series of questions and, and, and it, you know, studies that they will make. And if you want a loan, you have to prove them that you don't need it. So that was kind of back in the day. Uh, I think the Center for Economic Growth is a twofold. Number one, we focus on economic development. Uh, we are affiliated with the Chamber of Commerce. So we are uh, the economic development uh, arm of the Chamber. But there's another component which I participate in that not a lot of people know about it. And this is the NIST MEP, Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program. NIST MEP is uh, getting funds from the Secretary of Commerce. And our sole mission is to strengthen and grow small medium manufacturing companies. 
what, what is a small, small medium manufacturing, manufacturing company? company? Less than 500 employees and as minimum as five. So anyone with five employees will help them. Uh, so the way we do it, the way we approach it, uh, number one, I think that there's a lot of room for awareness. People do not know where the help, where the incentives, where the grants are. From 100 entrepreneurs or venturists or small companies, probably less than 2-3% are manufacturers. So I think that Sarah was talking about the food industry, that, I, that is a big one. There's some other industries uh, that will get, that will get priority versus you know manufacturing companies within the state of New York within the capital region and I know that Buffalo as well has gotten some good news in terms of investment and funds so does the capital region there's going to be at least for the next 10 years growth uh, something that we already forgot thank God is that we were shut down for almost 18 months Something that some some that we already forgot is that we were waiting months and months for goods to get into the port to be transformed into products and services for you know the people of the U.S. So the challenge is, uh, you know, President Biden, Executive Order fourteen zero zero five in twenty twenty one. It is ensuring future is made in all of America for. American, American workers. workers. He doesn't make any distinction about immigration status. He's just saying people located here. And I think that taking that task and communicating that accordingly and creating the ecosystem for entrepreneurs to get into the manufacturing, it is very hard. So we have the chamber with Daniel doing an excellent job on anything else with entrepreneurs, we started our own boot camp for entrepreneurs in manufacturing. Sometimes we have three, sometimes we have five, sometimes we have classes of 10 people. And at the end of the day, only a couple will actually make the next, the next round. Uh, there's a lot of funding for current manufacturing companies, regardless of who owns them. Uh, this is a for everyone type of support. And at the same time, there's a lot of incentives for entrepreneurs with good ideas. And this is through also NIST MEP. They do fund innovation. They do fund, uh, you know, ideas. They do fund new commercialization programs. But something in between, between that idea and the manufacturing is, is where we are having problems connecting the dots. In terms of access to funding, in terms to access to support, uh, there's one line that I think that Nasser and, and Representative and Senator also mentioned, as well as Danielle. This is a community effort, and everyone's trying to do the best they can. So we have the government and economic development, we have the education sector, which shouldn't be not only higher education. Higher education is, is participating, but I think that we need to start younger in terms of manufacturing. We have a bunch of nonprofits, us included, trying to do the best we can. We have workforce development initiatives. We have employers, some of them participating to enhance the community. And we have incubators. We need to do more with entrepreneurs on that manufacturing ecosystem. Companies well placed, uh, we're attracting them into the region. What we want to do is develop the supply chain locally. That, that is what is going to make the difference. Not only the company building and assembling and putting stuff together in the United States, but we're trying to develop the supply chain. And, and I always meet with clients or with customers in the capital region. And I, and I told them, it's not enough to do things made in America. You have to make them effectively in America. You have to be productive. 
you have to follow through. I think that one of the, of the big challenges, and I'll, I'm, I'm wrapping up with this one because I don't want to put you to sleep. The, the great challenges for many businesses across the board is not what we don't know, it is what we don't know that we don't know. And there are current resources for these companies to guide them, especially with, I mean, and now we do have as well a program with, you know, uh, 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 English as a second language. Uh, uh, we provide companies with support for uh, uh, immigrants on, on the work for the company side. But we want to do more on the put your own business side of the equation, Asha. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Figueroa. Um, one, one more question um you've fr from your from your uh do you would do you have a question mr driver do you like to ask i just would like to um uh, thank carlos for like say, saying what he's saying about manufacturing because it's really super important um we also have a manufacturing facility and have seen that firsthand i think there was an opportunity during covid to bring manufacturing back to america and that's something that we need this is how cities are deteriorating in, in the United States, especially like if we look at Detroit, if we look at these uh, big industrial cities, and we have enough of an immigrant workforce that we can populate in manufacturing if we want to bring it back. Labor costs are high, but with technology and so forth, we can figure a way around it because the more that we give our manufacturing away, it's not just that made in America, it's also made by immigrants and Americans in America, then uh, we're you know, we're deteriorating, you know, let's, the, the truth is, is that empires, you know, they, uh, they don't go killed, they commit suicide. And one of the ways to do that is through economic deterioration of manufacturing. Like, yeah, we have great grab on technology like AI and so forth and social media, but what happens with local products that are not manufactured here and they're just imported in, you know, that's something to think about. Thank you, Mr. Jaffer. That's, that's so, that is very, very true. Um, so the question I have for Mr. Figueroa is um, you've, um, you've you've traveled around the globe. You've seen how other countries work with uh, entrepreneurs and emerging businesses. Um, from in, in your opinion, what is uh, what, what is missing from how the United States and New York State support small businesses? That's something you've seen in other countries and other cultures that we could maybe bring in here. I would say that overall is that holistic approach on getting everyone involved, getting, getting everyone on the table and the decision making, and be very clear about what the long term objective is. Unfortunately, and I come from a country as well where you have transfer of power at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, every two, every four, every six years. And unfortunately, the multi-year and multi-decade economic development plans, they're just not there, or the one that is next to not consider that is that as important. I think that continuity, it is something that we could do much better. Uh, when, when you're thinking about putting your business and then say, well, workforce, guess what? This region is going to grow and you're competing against other manufacturing companies or other businesses for people. Uh, well, let's go to the schools. Well, you know, this is not such an attractive place. People doesn't have a place to live. People doesn't have a way to move if they don't have a car. There's no public transportation there's no way to get from point a to point b and guess what you know these guys from uh, the community bank are not paying attention anybody so i cannot get even a loan for a house and then schools are so bad so at the end of the day we're not just talking about putting a business we're talking about everything else that will surround the economic development of, of, of the region so uh i dare because i and i'm not saying it's better I'm, I'm just saying these guys think about it. So there's some countries that said, well, I'm going to put my factory in the middle of nowhere because it's very cheap. Well, it's very cheap. So I will do it there. 
And since I don't have ways to construct the roads, I'm just going to put there, uh, uh, you know, living quarters. And I'm just going to put there, you know, communities. And I'm going to put, so they build the community <laughs> around the factory. They do that. I'm not saying that we should, but it's something that you actually need to consider. That's why it's not only the government or it's not only the, 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 the enterprise or it's not only uh, uh, the new profits is everyone together. So I think that's that's important to consider going forward. Thank you so much, Ms. Figaro. That is, I think that is the sentiment we're all expressing that it has to be a community level. We all have to be involved in this. Um, I will pass uh, on the torch back to Dr. Repke. Nasha, thank you so much. And I want to bring in a very important voice, Ms. Ayang Kim. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, the American, the Asian American Federation in 2022 issued a report, which was really a very good report that had three policy recommendations for activating and harnessing immigrant entrepreneurship, specifically Asian immigrant uh, entrepreneurship. And those recommendations were around providing financial assistance to small businesses in a format that meets their needs, especially after COVID and recovery from COVID, providing programs in languages that immigrants speak, and improving skills that Asian small businesses can access through workforce development. And so you acknowledge a lot of the barriers that exist and the model that you use in the Asian American Federation is really a tailored um, model that uh, target those unique barriers uh, that face immigrants. And we'd like to ask you if um, your recommendations were to be implemented at a local and state level by state agencies. How do you um, see that model of a tailored approach or a model where um, that uh, those recommendations are addressed being implemented? What are the challenges that we have in implementing that model, uh, whether for mainstream workforce development uh, and business support uh, systems or, or um, generally? How do you think we should uh, can scale um, those recommendations? Thank you, Dr. Can I excuse my, I have to uh, jump in for a minute. I have to check out at 1130. Uh, thanks so much for uh, this presentation. I was very happy to work with everybody and everyone knows how to reach me if you want to want to follow up. Thank you, Senator Ryan, so much. Thank you. I, I have the same schedule, so we'll both be heading out, but thank you very much. Thank you, Assembly great. members. Ter Terpy, we really appreciate your presence and your comments. Back to Aya. Thank you, Dr. Repke. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, I want to say also, start off with a shout out to um, Ms. Venegupalan for the beautiful presentation to talk about institutional and immigrant hurdles that our communities face when it comes to securing finance and growing their businesses. And in terms of what are the current barriers that we see today, and I will be reaching back out to senators um, and the assembly member about this, is that the little bit of encouragement that we saw in the change in policy and trying to make sure that um, sourcing uh, finances is accessible and somewhat equitable for immigrant community, um, I see that there's a bit of a lost political will as we are coming out of the pandemic times. Um, at, at the time during the pandemic, we saw a lot of effort from both state and city to make sure that there is more language access. And that kind of effort has kind of dwindled with both the kind of, um, the, the sense that, you know, AI and like you know, translation services that are now readily available is quite enough. People seem to misunderstand that they think that there's a, it's a, just a box to check and say, okay, there is a translated material, therefore everybody is covered. We learned from the emergency measures during the pandemic, however, that that's not the case, right? Um, it's great to have a lot of like language access in terms of marketing material or just the basic information about what the new policies and new resources available are. But once people apply, there's another whole array of miscommunication and loss in translation where people really need an investment into the relationship that is built to handle the business owners who don't understand the documentation and financial 
uh, requirements that they have to have in order to access this finance, or the very fact that we heard throughout today, the, uh, throughout the session this morning, about the credit requirements and the banking credit um, banking requirements that individuals have to show that is different from their home country, or in fact, especially for a new business owner, even if you're born here, you may not quite understand exactly how that works. So, in terms of increasing access, we we're very happy to see the change in um, the government agencies trying to increase access during the pandemic. And we hope to see that kind of effort continued. Um, what is more important though, I think, is um, to really think about how and where do you meet the need for, for the immigrant community, right? It's not just the fact of like ge geographical needs of like certain communities are in certain area, like the Burmese community in Buffalo are, um, very thriving and new, newly um, established business community. However, they actually don't speak Burmese, they speak Karen. Um, according to the state or the census information, they just come up as Burmese. So um, just having that, like again, language access to check off as a box to say, do you have Burmese information is simply not enough. And then when you also look into like, well, what are the changing needs of the business owners today? I think uh, Ms. Davis touched, uh, sorry, Ms. Rutgers talked, touched upon, upon this very briefly earlier. And I really agree with you there. When you say um, immigrant business owners, like they tend to have str uh, more trouble staying afloat after the financing has been given. It's mainly because for them, financing and loans especially are literally the last resort possible, right? There is a huge pushback towards like getting loans because we don't understand what is a system of loans and don't understand that getting a loan can actually increase your credit, for example. And nowadays, especially for the uh, more traditional immigrant communities like the Korean and Chinese communities that have started out in the 60s and 70s, um, we see a huge change in the generation of immigrant entrepreneurs where they were looking forward to retirement before the pandemic. And now uh, for those that did stay alive throughout the pandemic days, they are now looking into how they, can they scale down their business or how can they sell their business, not necessarily looking to grow. But that doesn't mean they don't need a loan. In fact, they might need a more specifically tailored loan like refinancing their current debt um, to make sure that they do stay afloat. So in terms of um, meeting the needs of immigrant communities, we have to think about both the language access and cultural appropriateness, as well as like really seeing what is the changing needs right now? What kind of new system do, do, does the immigrant community need? Thank you so much, Young. And I wanna give the final word to Christine uh, Rutgers. Um, I see Danielle, you have your hand up. Uh, do you want to uh, comment on uh, um, Ms. Young, Ms. Kim's um, comments? Please uh, go. Yes, please. Um, just to corroborate what she said, what I have found working with um, the BIPOC community here in the capital region, I came across a Vietnamese lady who has a restaurant, and I also came across um, another cafe owned by a Filipino and a Puerto Rican immigrants, Spanish, and I'm not sure what language Filipinos speak. But during the pandemic, they never got the PPP. Why? One simple mistake in filling those forms out and not understanding the question because English is not your first language can cause you not to get the PPP loan. And in both those instances, that's what happened. The Vietnamese lady never got it because, and once you make that mistake and it, and, and, and it's not understanding how to fix it, and then you hear, this is not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. With the Puerto Rican and the Filipino, they were approved for the restaurant revitalization fund and they lost it because of something else happening. And again, it's, it's the way they answered a question, are you MWBE? They are. They're women, they're minorities, but they're not MWBE certified. So, you know, it's it's understanding the little nuances and this is where language and culture comes in. And so um, that's an excellent point. And just to go back on what Christine had said about they may get the micro loan, but they're not sustainable. And that's why it's important. Like when we do the boot camp and we require them to have financial projections, they have to show how they're going to be sustainable, show how you're going to scale, show growth. And that's 
one of the hardest things to try and explain to an entrepreneur that, yeah, you want this money, but let's see if the business is even scalable. See if the business is sustainable. See if there is a market for your product because you may have an excellent idea. You may have an excellent product, but no one in the capital region may buy it. Maybe you need to be in Florida or California. So that is one of the big problems. You know, it's not just about getting a grant or a loan, but making sure before you give that money that there is the wraparound support system in place to help these businesses to be able to scale, to grow. It's teaching a man to fish as opposed to just handing them the fish. Absolutely, Danielle. Thank you. Very, very wise words for sure. It's it's really about building a business plan and about the feasibility and staying away from saturated markets. It's all of that. I want to give the last word to Christine Rutgers. Um, what advice would you like to give to your colleague, whether in the financial system, whether in the legislature, or even aspiring in immigrant entrepreneurs? Um, what would you tell them? What advice would you give them to uh, be more empowered, to access a better uh, system, and enable and sustain uh, their uh, entrepreneurial ventures? Yeah, I think it goes back to what um, Danielle said. It's the education piece and the, the SBDC is here for that, working on the business plan, working on the projections that helps to make sure you're sustainable. And usually when you do that with somebody, you can find out even if they want to do it, right? That may be overwhelming for them. That may be something that they just can't sustain and do, but that's what we're here for. We have to make sure that they're passionate, that's critical to their success, identifying the barriers, um, you know, the willingness for them to learn and to have some, I call it skin in the game, so to speak, right? Because you have to have that passion to be an entrepreneur. Um, and as hard as as an advisor to move those roadblocks for some people, but stay committed, stay adaptable, find a mentor in your industry is something huge that I ask of all my people to do. Um, and put the hard work in even when you're facing the challenge. But it starts with one I mean, we're a center. So it starts with one center of education and knowing that this is needed, um, teaching the American financial system to these people and, and creating that environment where they're comfortable to come back and ask those questions to us is imperative. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of challenges out there and it's one, one step at a time. Thank you so much, Christine. And with that, you know, unfortunately, we ran over time and we apologize about that. So, uh, again, the main theme that we heard over and over here is that it's an all of a community, all uh, community on uh, all on all hands on back a whole of community approach uh, that is needed. Um, it is definitely a promise and a potential uh, to elevate poverty, mitigate it, and a critical economic development mechanism that we need to harness. Um, there are unique barriers, again, that you heard here um, and that need to be addressed. Um, definitely the tailored approach that the Asian American Federation uh, brings and others bring are is the gold standard Standard. But um, it, how do you create mainstream systems that really integrate the needs of immigrants, uh, prospective entrepreneurs? That would be really the the key challenge for us. It's not just about you know addressing language and culture. It's about taking the curriculum that you have, the training curriculum, and adapt it to the needs of these entrepreneurs with knowledge of what they know and what they may not know um but it's also about really empowering uh, empowering them to to sustain the business not just to create it but sustain it there's so much to cover so much to go over please stay tuned for a policy brief that will be 
um, will capture what we discussed here today and uh, what uh, Asha uh, so ably worked on. Uh, but thank you again so much for everybody, our distinguished panelists for an in incredible conversation. Thank you for our keynote speaker, Nasa Jabber. All uh, best wishes to you all. And uh, please have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, this has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.